when the Apostle Paul sets out to describe for us the fruit of the Spirit, the first item on his list is love. But what exactly is biblical love? How is it different than simple affection? Today on Truth For Life Weekend, Alistair Begg describes this essential trait and explains how God's Spirit empowers us to love with supernatural self-sacrifice. We're in Galatians chapter 5, but Alistair begins by pointing to a statement Jesus made in John 15, 5. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if a branch does not bear fruit, it is cut off and it is thrown away and it's burned. And quite challengingly, he says to them, the true disciple of mine will be recognizable by her fruit, by his fruit. So it won't be recognizable, first of all, as a result of the things we say— but as a result of the evident fruitfulness in our life. Well, what kind of fruit? Well, we just read of it, didn't we? Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on. It's very challenging, isn't it? Now, in light of that, let me just make a number of statements that you can search the Scriptures and ensure that I'm telling you the truth. First thing that we need to notice about this fruit is that it is a consequence— of our having been brought to faith in Jesus. It is a consequence. Secondly, growth in this regard, growth of fruitfulness, is an evidence of the transforming power of the gospel, that the work which God begins in us, he brings along the line to completion. The third thing to notice is that this fruit is singular, is singular. Now, at the head of the list, and understandably so, is love. The fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, love. Love, if you like, is not so much a trait or a characteristic as it is the inner disposition out of which all these other things flow, so that true love is seen in joyfulness and in patience and in so on. Paul uh, says that the love of God has been poured out uh, by the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. Uh, That's uh, Romans chapter 5, isn't it? God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? It doesn't say that it has been injected um, through a narrow vein. It doesn't say that it has been eked in. It says that it has been lavished in. It has been poured out upon us. And this is the work of the Spirit of God. And the outpouring of the love of God is the story of the Bible. It is the unique nature of God himself. God is both light and God is love. He is more than that, but he is not less than that. The source is in God. The emphasis that comes from God is in the self-giving of his only Son, the story of amazing good news. And this is lavished upon us. And the strange and yet wonderful thing about it is this, that when you and I think about love and about loving somebody else, if we are deep down honest, more often than not, our expressions of love are directly related to the attractiveness or the worthiness of the object of our affection. So we will express love because we find the person attractive or because we believe they are worthy somehow or another. But that is not the love of God. You remember in Deuteronomy 7 where you have that immense thought that God did not set his love upon you, uh, says Moses, because you were greater or bigger or more significant. No. The Lord loved you because he loved you. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means exactly what it says, that God's love has no regard to our merits, has no regard to our merits. So again, the things that mark division amongst people in communities are often directly related to status and to merits and to education and to achievements and to finance and to background and to whatever else it is. 
Well, is there a place where those things are dismantled and neutralized? Where the very things that we use as the platform for our own self-aggrandizement or for our horrible divisions with one another is, is just completely set apart? Yes, the answer is amongst the people of God. That is what it's supposed to be. Because the love of God towards us that is lavished upon us is without any merit. And it is that love to us which is then to flow through us. I don't think we've sung this in a hundred years, but, and maybe we haven't sung it at all, but we used to sing it in Edinburgh a long time ago. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. For I see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. There's great wisdom in that. Where does this love come from? This is supernatural love. And this love is a love expressed through us that is both Godward and manward, all the way through the Old Testament. God is to be loved with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, and we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And that, Jesus says, is the summation of the great commandment. In fact, our love for our fellow man is the validation of our expressed love for God. This is what makes this very hard. I can convince myself that I am very interested in loving everybody while I'm just driving in my car by myself until I have someone I have to love. <laughs> then it gets real hard at that point. I can convince myself that I have a great love for God. I have sang this song with great, you know, great effervescence, I, I have said. Yeah, but what about? You see, the validation of genuine Christian experience vis-a-vis -vis the love of God is actually seen in everyday working clothes. For anyone, says John, who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he hasn't seen. And he has given this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I mean, there's no middle ground here, is there? So what then is this love that is both Godward and manward? Just a couple of things as we move to a close. The nature of this love is that, first of all, it takes the initiative. The love of God is an initiative-taking love. In fact, genuine love always takes the initiative. You and I have been involved in an argument. Love is the one that takes the initiative. Whether you were wrong or right or what you were, love should take the initiative. It doesn't always, but it should. Secondly, this love cannot ignore the needs of a brother. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? You see the challenge that comes here? Here you are, and you say that you love God very much, and you're a very God-loving community, and you're a church, and you sing these songs, and you're very concerned, and you do the Bible study, and you're in the life group, and you know a lot about the Bible and various Christian doctrine and everything else. And the Bible says, yeah, and how, how's the love thing going? How's the love thing going? That's the challenge. It takes the initiative. It doesn't ignore the needs of the needy. Thirdly, it forgives with or without apologies for the wrong done to it. This is really saying the same thing from the other side. It's not uncommon for us to say, well, I, I'm pre prepared to forgive if, provided that, and she can jolly well come in and apologize to start with. That'll get it going. And then a few more things. And then... Okay, so you don't want to love the person at all. So, so when I say that... What I'm saying is, I don't love God enough to love you. I don't love God enough. Because the love that God has for me is a forgiving love that is not based on any merit in me. He came and sought me out when I wasn't looking for him. He forgave me all my transgressions. Am I then going to hold some piddling little offense against my brother or my sister, not if I've been overwhelmed by the love of God. You see, the love of God is expressed in forgiveness. Fourth thing is that this love 
is not so much a question of our feelings, but a matter of our will and of our action. That's important, isn't it? It's not, it's not a victim of our emotions. It is a servant of our wills. Otherwise, how do we deal with exhortations to love? People say, well, you don't have to exhort me to love. You don't have to say, put on love. Pardon? Yes. It's not a feeling that we feel. It's a decision that we make. It's an enabling we enjoy, but it's an action that we take. And fifthly, this love is the permanent priority of the Christian life. It's the permanent priority of the Christian life. You say, well, are you going to get through the whole thing without reading our favorite passage on love? Probably. This, you, did you have this at your wedding? It wasn't wrong to have it at your wedding. It's just that it's got nothing really to do with a wedding. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's right in the middle of all the divisiveness of the church in Corinth. They were arguing about what gifts were necessary and who had them and how it was going. And Paul says, well, let's just get this thing sorted out right now. You speak with the tongues of men and angels, but don't of love. You might as well be a gong or a clanging cymbal. You have prophetic powers, and you understand the whole Bible, and you're very knowledgeable. You have faith. You can move mountains, but no love. You're nothing. You're a very practical Christian. You give away all that you have. You're prepared to deliver up your body to be burned. But you don't have love? Nothing. It's quite staggering, isn't it? You see, this love, this love is supernatural. It's not ours by inheritance or by temperament. You know, his dad was a really nice guy, and he's a nice guy, too. That may be true, but that's not what this is about. This love is not achieved as a result of going to a course, as a result of uh, reading a book on it, of being educated in it. And as we've said, this love is not attached externally. It's not self-generated. If it were self-generated, then it may be the occasion of pride. But it is the work of God. Therefore, we are utterly dependent. Oh, says somebody, well, then does that mean that the key to it is that you do nothing? So, if you want to really become— uh, if you want the emblematic reality to be seen in you, just sit quietly and wait for it to happen. No. Remember Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That sounds like something you're supposed to do. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, the exhortations are in light of the infusion which we experience as a result of being in Christ. There's, there's no doubt that, that, that we are imperfect in our fruitfulness. There is no doubt that we are a work in progress. There is no doubt that we will have to wait until the day when all uh, sin is removed and when we are seen in the transcendent splendor of Christ. There's no doubt about that. But in the meantime, what the Bible is saying is that with the enablement of the Spirit of God, we are to make sure that the graces which are made available to us, the traits of Christian character, are then to be put on the way you put clothes on. So Colossians, after he's given us uh, the first two chapters of the indicatives of what it means to be in Christ through the gospel, he then says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Seek these things which are above where Christ is seated. It is because you, of your identity that you now engage in this activity. What is that involved? Well, it involves taking off your old stuff. You once were marked by these things. You have the same thing here in Galatians 5, by envy and by spite and by licentiousness and by a dreadful catalog of things. Nobody who does these things as a habitual pattern of behavior will inherit the kingdom of God. But you don't need to be concerned about that because you have been placed in Christ, provided that now you recognize that you must no longer sow to these things which will appear so attractive to you, even as a Christian. Take them off and put these on. And when you've been putting them on, over all of these, put on love 
which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, we grow in the Christian life by divine grace. But it is also true that it is our duty to grow in grace. We say, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, the quality of grace is such that though it is strength from God, still we must use it. The electricity power source comes to my home, but it doesn't turn the toaster on until I turn the toaster on. It doesn't turn the lights on until I use the power that is made available to me. Now, listen as I close this. This, loved ones, is why all the things that pastors routinely talk about, sounding probably to some as if it's just what pastors need to do to ensure job security, right? So the pastor says, now, it's very important that, uh, that you read your Bible. It's very important that you pray. It's very important that you're in the fellowship of God's people. It's very important that you are attending routinely, regularly upon the public worship of God. It is absolutely vitally important that you do not absent yourself from the celebration of communion. Aren't those the things that the pastor says again and again? Do you know why? Because the Holy Spirit uses means in producing the fruit in our lives. The neglect of the means impacts our fruitfulness, so that the things that he has given us in order to become the full-orbed, ripened fruit that he attractively creates for us in Jesus is impacted for good or for ill to the extent that we either embrace or stand back from the objective means. And those objective means that I have just outlined to you are then to be matched, if you like, by the subjective means. Because if you think about it, we all know that it is possible to read your Bible, rub -a -dub -a -dub -a -dub -dub, finished. We all know it is possible, say the Lord's Prayer. We all know it's possible to come to church. We all know it's possible to sing the song so that the external objective means of grace are not then benefiting us because we are not using, if you like, the subjective means, which are what? Well, being prepared to bow underneath the word when it is proclaimed, committing ourselves to thinking about what the Bible says, committing ourselves to listening with all the ears of our hearts, committing ourselves to questioning ourselves, so that when we read 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we're not saying, oh, that's nothing to do with me. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. I'm in the faith. Look, I just got a new Bible. <laughs> I'm in the faith. I went twice last week. No, committing ourselves to saying, I need to have a look here at the, at the fruit, admonishing my own heart, admonishing myself, sharing what's on my heart with those who know me, and being prepared to weigh their reaction to my sharing. Because, you see, you can't see yourself grow. Children don't see themselves grow. Their grandparents come from out of town and go, Johnny, you have grown. And Johnny says, have I? You can measure it, but you don't feel it. I know you get growing pains, whatever they are. The medics can explain later, but I, I don't know what that is. But you, you don't feel yourself growing. You don't go to your bed and go, I think I'm growing right now. <laughs> so you don't know if you're growing. See, the real test is not whether I think I'm growing. 
No, the real test is whether my wife thinks I'm growing, or whether you see I'm growing, or whether I see you're growing. In joy, in peace. You know I mean, we, we, we know how it goes, don't we? We, we take 1 Corinthians 13, and you take the you take and put your name in it. It's the most devastating uh, experience of a lifetime, isn't it? A- Alistair is patient. <laughs> Alistair is kind. Alistair keeps no record of wrongs. It's like, ooh, this is terrible. <laughs> These are the means that God uses to prune out the dead stuff and to energize the good stuff. Let's pray for the churches in Cleveland to this end, that if anybody comes into town and comes to the communities, into gospel communities, that they will encounter something of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing our study of the fruit of the Spirit, you're listening to Alistair Begg, and this is Truth For Life Weekend. Alistair will return in a moment to close with prayer, so please keep listening. Now, as we wrap up the first full week of the new year, it's not too late for you to commit to one more New Year's resolution. If you've been thinking about starting a new daily devotional this year, we want to recommend to you a book by J.C. Ryle called Daily Readings. J.C. Ryle was a British pastor in the 19th century. His writings continue to be cherished by believers all around the world. This devotional takes the content from seven commentaries that Ryle wrote on the Gospels and divides those up into daily readings, two for each day of the year. So you begin and end each day revisiting the remarkable accounts of Jesus' earthly life, his death, and his resurrection. We'd love to send you a copy of this substantial resource so you can begin this important pattern while the new year is still fresh. Learn how to request the devotional titled Daily Readings when you go to truthforlife.org. Or if you'd rather have your devotional in a digital format, you can subscribe to the free Truth For Life daily devotional. The brief readings are taken from the writings of Charles Spurgeon and are delivered straight to your email inbox each day. Subscribing is quick and easy. Simply go to truthforlife.org and look for the daily devotional. Don't forget, while you're on our website, you can also browse through the message archive, view transcripts of messages, or choose from hundreds of videos to watch of Alistair's teaching. Plus, if you go to truthforlife.org slash live, you can check out when Alistair's preaching will be streamed live. So take some time this weekend and explore all of the resources available at truthforlife.org. Now here's Alistair to close with prayer. Father, help us to this end, we pray. Thank you that um, this is not an exhortation to pull up our socks and to do our best. It is a reminder of the wonder of your work in us and through us, so that although we are not all that we might be, by your grace we're not what we once were, and that together we may be able to exhort and encourage one another in these matters. Help us to this end, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us next weekend as we continue learning about the fruit of the Spirit. We'll discover how believers can experience God's supernatural joy even in painful situations. This program and the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life, where the learning is for living.